So good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for attending. My name is Miss Anderson. I teach US history at Laguna Beach High School. Um, and I'm very excited to have partnered with the Laguna Beach Historical Society for our evening's talk um, and get to offer this unique perspective on history to all of you. So I hope that you enjoy our talk and our presenters have worked very hard to bring you our unique history and uh, provide lots of engaging photos and stories for you guys to better get to know your city. So I'm gonna get started with our first presenter so that she can talk to us about the homesteaders of Laguna Beach. Um, so Ms. Carol Vebeck Lloyd, um, Carol was born and raised in Southern California. She is a retired educator and reading specialist who continues to work with children on reading and literacy. And she is a grandmother of six. She loves traveling to Africa to help with early reading and ESL initiatives in Malawi and Rwanda and hopes to go back after the restrictions are lifted. She loves to paint, listen to music, visit with family and friends and share about local history. Um, and Ms. Vivek Lloyd is going to take it away with our first topic here. Oh, thank you. And I want to thank Shelby Anderson and Victoria Weber, the Laguna Beach uh, School District. And I am honored to be a part of Laguna Beach Historical Society as a board member and share that with such special cohorts that are on that board and other members throughout the community. But I'm gonna to share tonight about three areas in my presentation. The first is about my mother's primary research on our family's early history in Laguna. The second is about our first generation great, great grandfather who came to Laguna in 1871. And the third is about my great, great uncle who started to develop downtown Laguna. Next slide. The first part of my presentation is about my mother, Burl Wilson Bebeck, who spent many years researching and compiling primary research about our early family in Laguna Beach. In doing so, she not only located a lot of information about our own family's history, but also important information about other early settlers here. She is now passed on, so I want to continue to share about her amazing work. Next slide. But before I do, I wanna talk about a very critical piece of legislation that brought many early pioneers here to Laguna Beach. Abraham Lincoln wanted to open up the West. Also, he wanted to promote settling in the Great Plains of the United States. So he put together, along with many others, of course, the Homestead Act, which Congress passed in 1862. And this slide, basically in the central area, talks about the Homestead Act. It was, as I mentioned, developed in 1862 and passed by Congress. You could be 21 years of old age, head of the family, and you could have 160 acres of land if you improved that land within five years and or you could buy it for a small amount of money. The US government encouraged westward movement and expansion and the Homestead Act allowed thousands of settlers to move west and start new lives. Next slide. For many years, my mother had heard that our family owned a government appropriated uh, land area in Laguna. So after spending many years searching in libraries and historical organizations, she went up to Sacramento with my father in the mid 1990s and found the homestead title for our earliest settler, Henry Rogers. And on the left is a copy of the homestead title that she found while up in, in Sacramento. And that is Henry Rogers exact uh, title signed by the President of the United States during that time, who was Rutherford B. Hayes. And um, so that she got a copy of those and she, uh, as I'll continue to share, put that all together. She also, besides our own great great grandfather, which was six generations back from myself, she also located 38 other homestead titles belonging to different homesteaders in Laguna Beach. Each one had to be signed by the current US president for that time. And, and ours was signed, as I mentioned, by Rutherford B. Hayes. And home study took place in Laguna from 1876 to 1911. Next slide. After locating all of the 39 homestead titles on microfiche, 
in Sacramento, my mother listed all of the individual designated owners of each homestead, the date of the homestead, and the amount of acreage that that person received, and the president who signed that homestead. They were divided in Laguna into three townships, as they were called. So at the top section of that slide, and that's my mother's typing, and she listed it all. She was tremendously methodical and, and intelligent in her approach to all of this. But at the top, you'll see the arrow pointing to the first township was Laguna Beach. The second one in the middle was Arch Beach, and the bottom was Aliso South Laguna. George Fountain was the first homesteader. Whoops, back to that slide again, just for a minute. The, um, First homesteader in Laguna was George Fountain, and our ancestor, George Rogers, is the fifth one down in Laguna. You'll see him three, three points down or five points down from that. And George Thurston, whose homestead is where the ranch is now located, which is old Ben Brown's on PCH, he was the first homesteader in the bottom section in Aliso in the South Townships, acquiring his homestead in 1879. Next slide. After making copies of each of the 39 homestead titles, my mother went on to lay out each homestead's range and plot lines on a Laguna Beach street map, putting in all the coordinates of each. She added details and other pieces of interesting information on that map. And um, if you can share screen right now, Shelby, um, I just wanted to share with you that this is the original map that my mother created. It's about a foot and a half, two feet by three and a half feet. And uh, I remember often going over to her house and she had a yardstick and a marker. And she made all of those lines off of those titles that she found in Sacramento. And then she wrote all of that information about each of the uh, townships. Here's the first township, the second, and the third. And um, so she, she, and that was an original Laguna Beach street map that she acquired. And then she laid all that out on that map. So um, I wanted to share that map with you. So next slide. Um, let's see. So now on to the second area that I want to talk about with you, and that is my great great grandfather. Um, and he, as I mentioned earlier, is Henry Rogers. Do we see that um, PowerPoint, Shelby? Yeah, oh, now the next slide. Okay. Now the first, the second area that I wanted to share is about Henry Rogers, and that is our first settler in Laguna from our family. And that's a, a close up of my mother's map. And that's his homestead that uh, we have outlined in red. And that's right up above downtown Laguna. So his homestead was 160 acres and it went over from Temple Hills over to Bluebird Canyon. And on the left is Laguna Canyon Road. And down of course at the bottom is Main Beach. So uh, next slide. Henry came from Galena, Illinois. He farmed his land, but when the crops went dormant, he and other family members worked in the lead mines. As a result of such toxic conditions in those mines, his and others' health was ter terribly impacted. Because of this, he was very motivated to come to California when he saw advertisements in Galena, Illinois, which stated California for better health and better climate. So this is the conditions that they worked in. Uh, next slide. So in 1871, he and his brother took a paddle wheel boat down the Mississippi River and caught a steamship out of New Orleans. They headed down Cape Horn, which is the tip of South America, and eventually up to San Francisco. From there, Henry headed down to Orange County while his brother traveled on. He soon wrote back to his wife, Elizabeth, who was 44 years old, telling her to sell everything and bring anyone who wanted to come to California. So in 1874, Elizabeth and 22 family members and friends took two boxcars on the Transcontinental Railroad. It took three to four weeks to arrive in California. And in 1874, Henry picked them up in Orange County in a horse-drawn wagon. 
Next slide. So now on to my third area to present to you. Henry and Elizabeth's son, George Rogers, acquired a homestead of downtown Laguna in 1881. George and his wife, Lottie, started out there with four children, but eventually they had 11 total. Their homestead consisted of 155 and a half acres, going back to Canyon Acres and Laguna Canyon, almost to Park Avenue, down to Main Beach, and was bordered on the left by Broadway or Laguna Canyon Road. They built this small house, which is called the Ranch House, right where the current city hall on Third Avenue now resides. A painting of the Ranch House is currently hanging in the main lobby area of the city hall. Next slide. George's wife, Lottie, and their first child, Sarah, planted the pepper tree in front of the city hall. It is still standing there after 133 years, but it's recently had been trimmed back uh, very heavily to preserve its health. George went on to plow the roads of his newly subdivided Laguna Beach downtown with a horse-drawn wagon. And I'll show you that slide in just a minute of his subdivision. He plowed not only the main streets in downtown Laguna, but he also plowed the first dirt road of Pacific Coast Highway in front of Main Beach. George also went on to naming Forest Avenue, which he plowed because of all the eucalyptus trees he and his father, Henry, planted on Forest Avenue. He also named Ocean Avenue because he could see the ocean from his ranch house. Next slide. From early on, George wanted to lay out the beginnings of a small town in Laguna, mainly where downtown Laguna now exists. He hired and paid a well-known surveyor to help subdivide the downtown area into 323 lots. He sold a number of the lots to our family members, some of them still owning those lots. So on this map, it ends up being a triangular shape, of course, and down at the base of that map is Main Beach. And at the top point of that map is basically where their ranch house was, where the X is, and now is where the city hall is. It's called Rogers Edition because there was an added portion to this map on the right-hand side. So, uh, so now, next slide. Bringing all this up to the present, this is an aerial map with a current view of downtown Laguna. So much has taken place, of course, since those early homesteaders arrived. You can see the original triangular shape that George Rogers subdivision map had laid out with this aerial view. So that concludes my presentation and uh, I, I hope you enjoy it and appreciate those early hard you know, working settlers that came here. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I'm going to move on to our next presenter, which is Mr. Eric Jessen, who is a museum art detective. And he is going to talk to us about the art history of Laguna Beach. Thanks, Ms. Anderson. Next. About 20 years after Thurston's established uh, the homestead uh, or the ranch in Laguna, at Laguna is in Liso Canyon, the next wave of settlers showed up. Guess who they were? Artists. William Lees Judson and Norman St. Clair gave birth to Laguna's first art colony. Judson was the founding dean of the School of Fine Arts and Architecture at USC. You can see him in the photograph at the right and a picture of the Thurston Homestead in Liso Canyon at the left. Next. They simply did this by bringing students down to Laguna beginning in 1896 to paint outdoors. Our area was so beautiful that many of the artists decided to move here. And this created a mini construction boom in town, building their early artists' homes and studios that gently dotted the virgin landscape from north to south Laguna. In the upper right, we have a painting by Judson, which is titled Great Blue Heron in Laguna, which is at the mouth of the Liso Canyon, the students painting outdoors. And in the lower right, the original Laguna Beach Artists Association's first gallery in the parking lot of today's Hotel Laguna, founded in 1919. Next. Now, the Irvines had a very big influence in town why? Because they owned all the land 
of North, they owned all of North Laguna down to Broadway as part of their 120,000 acre ranch that stretched along the coast up past Newport Bay and inland over the mountains as far as the Santa Ana River where the 91 freeway is today. On the upper left, we have James Irvine II on his wedding day, parenthetically, in San Francisco in uh, 1893. Their beach house in Irvine Cove at the bottom and the family sprawled out on Main Beach in front of the old Hotel Laguna. And as you can see, beach attire has changed a lot since then. Next. Our Artists Association was organized and co-founded by two people in 1918. One was Edgar Payne, one of our most famous artists. Payne had a great car and a good camera, and he spent a lot of his career painting not only in Laguna, but also up into Eastern Sierra Canyons that you drive by on your way to Mammoth. He also drove his car from Laguna all the way to New York City, put it on a boat to cross the Atlantic Ocean, and spent two years painting between Brittany, France, and Venice, Italy, including traveling through the Alps. So the canvas on the left is titled uh, Nature's Majesty, and that's up Big Pine Canyon, which is Big Pine's a little town about 16 miles south of Bishop. Uh, the Matterhorn, obviously, is recognizable in the Alps and a photograph of Edgar Payne. Next. After two years in Europe, in 1926, Payne sailed with his car back to New York City and stopped to give a series of lectures at the Chicago Art Institute. And there, on the last night he was lecturing, he met a young adventurous photography student named George Orell. Now, facing the prospect of driving back across the rough American terrain to Laguna with his wife and young daughter, with no transcontinental highway system yet in place, Payne knew he could use an extra pair of arms to help get the car unstuck, fix the breakdowns, and change tires. So he brought George Orell for the long ride back to Laguna. And it's a long story, but in a nutshell, George Orell became one of the world's most famous people photographers. Here in the center, he's coming into town, driving right into Laguna in the Ford. Uh, the photograph on the left is one of his famous portraits of actress Jane Russell, who parenthetically went to high school with my mom. And then on the uh, lower right, a, a very famous painting of Jean Harlow. Next. Now, William Wendt was considered the granddaddy of all of our artists, producing over 600 paintings. Here's his home studio at the foot of Arch Street. And his wife, Julia Bracken Wendt, was a very famous sculptress, especially crafting statues for major public buildings and parks. Next. The Old Coast Road, the painting on the right, is among Wendt's most famous paintings, if not the most famous painting of the entire plein air arts movement. Why? Because it's on the dust jacket of the encyclopedia of the plein air artists. And for your reference, Moss Point is to the left of the White House, right there. And uh, coincidentally, this painting sold at auction just a couple of years ago for $1.6 million. Uh, in the photo of the same scene, you can actually see the dark building on the right, right there. That's where went. That's Went's home studio. So it's you can't see it on the screen today, but his house is not in the painting, which means the painting was painted before the photograph was taken. Next, not to be upstaged by Edgar Payne, Anna Hills was the other co-founder of the Laguna Artists Association. Now, she was one of the most active women in all of Laguna's history because she chaired the city's incorporation committee. So she's kind of thought of as being the mother of the city. She promoted planting trees all over town. And get this, she raised most of the money to build not only the art museum, but Laguna Presbyterian Church on Forest Avenue as well. Here we can see her at the groundbreaking for the art museum and the early art museum in the lower right. Next, we've got a couple of samples of her work. Uh, the, the painting on the left 
is the courtyard of the old Las Ondas Cafe on Main Beach, right next to where the, uh, the Hotel La Laguna is, where the term breakers comes from. And the dark tree planted in the courtyard around the 1890s is still standing as <laughs> the largest tree in Main Beach Park down next to the Hotel Laguna. And also a painting of another of our plein air artists, George Brandreth's wife, painted in Hemet. Next. William Griffith also ranked among the many famous artists in town. Here's his painting of the Big Bend in Laguna Canyon and his home studio uh, was located in the photograph right across the street from Las Brisas restaurant and the Heisler Park gazebo, right where the palm trees are. Next. Now, as an art detective, what I do for museums is find the exact spots on the ground from where the canvases were painted. In other words, where the easel stood on the ground. And in the lower, on the left painting by Joseph Kleitsch, um, you can, uh, Riddle Field and the Pavilion's Market are now situated in the dry arroyo at the bottom of the canvas, which is what we call Boat Canyon. And still standing today is the little gray house of early artist Ann Robinson at the corner of Hawthorne and Catalina, as well as the brown house right next door owned by the St. Clairs. And in the painting on the right, Eternal Surge, which is owned by Laguna Art Museum, the rocks awash in the surf are situated just below Twin Points, south of Crescent Bay. Next. Laguna's art history isn't just about painters and photographers. It's about living pictures as well. And the hundreds of our residents who helped create one of the world's most unique annual art events. At the behest of his wife, James Irvine II donated the land and built the first pageant of the Masters Amphitheater and the art festival grounds that strongly reinforces Laguna's worldwide reputation as an art colony. When our current pandemic calms down, you might consider following in the footsteps of many Laguna Beach High School alumni. Volunteer your ta ta talents to help keep the pageant and the festival going into the future. In addition, there are plenty of other volunteer opportunities in town that can use your energy and talent as well, including joining the Laguna Beach Historical Society. In the meantime, stay healthy and stay safe. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Jessen. We're going to have our next presenter, which is Dr. Glenna Matthews. She's going to talk to us about the 1950s and LBHS culture, but a little bit about her. After graduating from LBHS and college, Dr. Matthews obtained a doctorate in American history from Stanford and has since been a tenured professor at Oklahoma State University and a visiting associate professor at Berkeley, Stanford, UCLA, UC Irvine, and UC Davis. She is the author of six books, one co-authored, and some 20 scholarly articles. When she was at LBHS, she dreamed of foreign travel and has been fortunate enough to be sent on a 12-city European lecture tour by the US government and to receive Fulbrights to Moscow, Russia, and Genoa, Italy. Ms. Uh, Dr. Matthews, would you take it away then? My pleasure. I have to say that my first two presenters are tough acts to follow because I think, oh, I thought your presentations were absolutely wonderful. Uh, this evening, I'm wearing two hats. I'm talking both as a professional historian and as someone who attended Laguna Beach High School in the 1950s. I graduated in 1955 a long time ago, and um, the pictures I'm going to show are from the yearbook. I was the editor of the yearbook, so uh, I have a lot of memories here to uh, share with you. As a professional historian, I want to say that when historians talk about the 50s, uh, they talk about it as a decade of family togetherness, of heightened domesticity, Americans were coming out of the, uh, particularly white Americans, uh, were able to spend money on, on uh, domesticity and family togetherness. But all Americans uh, had gone through the Great Depression, a time of deprivation, 
and World War II, a time of sacrifice. And thanks to a strong union movement and the GI Bill, many, many millions of Americans were able to move into the middle class and buy homes for the first time. Home ownership uh, rose, spend money on appliances, backyard barbecues, etc. And so um, it's generally uh, among historians seen as a decade of conformity and as I say, family togetherness. Now there were a few male, primarily male icons of rebellion in the 50s, uh, Marlon Brando, James Dean, and perhaps most familiar, Elvis Presley, whose uh, rock and roll uh, music began to be popular about the time I graduated from high school. Uh, so can we see the first slide? The first slide is the elementary school that I attended. Uh, it was where the swimming pool is now. It was across the street from Laguna Beach High School. And there was no um, Top of the World. There was no El Moro. And by the way, there was also no Thurston. So everybody, K-12, uh, was housed in on one side of Park Avenue or the other. Uh, and in fact, when I was in elementary school, on Friday afternoons in football season, I could just walk across the street and see a football game. Next. Uh, this is this is the high school in those, this is, again, these are yearbook pictures. And I wanted to share this slide because pretty much every day, unless it was raining, we sat out on that lawn or on those steps to have lunch. And um, I don't know how many of you have seen American Graffiti with a parade of cars through uh, town, but the kids, the guys would drive cars back and forth on that street to the west of the high school. And we girls would be admiring. And the other point I wanna make is that lawn on the right was the senior lawn, or excuse me, on the left was the senior lawn. And um, if you were not a senior and you ventured on that lawn, it was bad things could happen. Now, I never saw this happen to a girl, I don't think a girl ever had the guts to uh, wander on that lawn, but a couple of times uh, boys who wanted to take chances wandered on and they got uh, their pants pulled down. So anyhow, uh, a beloved ritual among some. Next, uh, this is images of our football team, the fighting artists, not surprisingly, since we were an art colony, um, the football team was the artists and uh, it was quite something to see them come onto the field and we'd be yelling, go artists. As it happens, we had some very good football teams in when I was in high school. Um, in fact, when I was in elementary school, uh, we had a wonderful football team. Laverne Duggar was the big star. And now uh, I think it's the gym at Laguna Beach High School is uh, Duggar Gym and the field is um, Geyer Field and Red, Coach Red Geyer was the football coach. And, you know, I just have wonderful memories of going to high school football games. And we were in the CIF playoffs. And I remember going, I think it was to Brawley to see a playoff game. Uh, so uh, a lot of rituals that were similar to what you'd find in any high school in the 50s, so a lot of uh, energy around uh, high school sports. Next. This is the pep squad. Uh, on the left uh, were the cheerleaders. On the right, the song leaders. And uh, obviously it was a very prestigious thing to be uh, one of the cool kids and have one of those uh, positions. Next. And here's the picture from the prom. Uh, this is in the, I think, Christmas of 1954. And you'll see uh, all the young ladies are wearing uh, fairly similar formals, strapless with crinoline skirts, that is stiffening to make the skirts real poofy. And in fact, these poofy skirts were so popular 
that even um, in your school school clothes, um, a lot of times we wore crinoline under our full skirts to make our skirts real poofy. At that time, girls did not wear pants to school. That was a no-no. There was a dress code. Um, and so we all only wore skirts and very often they had crinolines under them. Um, next. Now here we get to what I want to argue is what set Laguna apart, what made it a little bit different than the uh, the usual uh, run of high school in the 50s, and that is the, the beach. The beach was incredibly central to our lives, as it, I presume it is now, but coming out of, uh, of World War II, as I say, there's this greater prosperity, more ability to spend money, and um, recreational activity was on that list, and we were able to go to the beach. Uh, our parents, we might have had after school jobs, but mostly during the summer, I mean, I can speak for myself. I spent every day of the summer on the beach. And I think that was pretty general. And at that point you could have beach parties at night. And uh, so uh, day and night we could uh, be found on the beach. And um, I want to I want to argue that because the beach was so much a part of our lives, that there's this kind of of hedonism um, that cut against the grain of the conformity of the dominant culture, and that this era that I'm talking about here was before um, Gidget and before the beach blanket. Babylon movies, but we were kind of present at the creation of a kind of um, beach centered culture that later in the decade uh, and then growing in the 60s became so seductive. And in fact, um, I recently read in French uh, a book that was published in France about Southern California beaches uh, because they're you know, they're the stuff of international fascination. And I attended a week or two ago, a webinar that the author um, conducted about her new book. And she said that the most watched program around the world now is Baywatch. So this Southern California beach culture has captivated a large, swath not only of uh, American culture, but internationally people are fascinated by uh, this, you know, pleasure loving, beautiful body, celebration of beautiful bodies that um, you see here in Southern California. Next. And I included this um, in, the, in the yearbook, though it's not Laguna, it's probably Hawaii but I thought it was a dramatic picture. And I, I, not too many things I remember about the editorial decisions I made in, you know, in 1950 something, but I remember including this picture because I wanted to have something to dramatize the you know, magnificence of our surfing. And as I say, it's just really beginning to get a toehold, not in, in our town, it was already big, but uh, it be, the you know the fame of surfing began was beginning to spread at this point, and just as an instance of how our cohort at Laguna Beach High School was part of the creation of this surf culture and beach culture, um, Tom Morey, who invented the boogie board, was a couple of years ahead of me at Laguna Beach High School, and Hobie Alter, and I know everybody knows Hobie and the Hobie store in downtown Laguna. He, I remember him wandering around town a lot, uh, always barefoot. I never saw him with shoes on. Uh, and he had just started his shop in Dana Point, which became a huge, uh, huge business. So the conformist fifties didn't play out quite that way in Laguna because the beach was such an attractive 
um, alternative and so seductive and so much a part of our daily lives. And that's my presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Matthews. I really appreciate your coverage of the 1950s culture. We have our next uh, presenter, Mrs. Anne Frank, who is a retired librarian for the UC Irvine Libraries. Um, she was the founding librarian of the library's Southeast Asian Archive. Additionally, she submitted nomination to the National Register of Historic Places for St. Francis by the Sea, which is the church that she is going to cover and talk about today. Hey, thank you, Shelby. Would you like me to click next? Yes, please click, yeah. All right. Tonight, I'm going to tell you about St. Francis by the Sea American Catholic Cathedral, located at 430 Park Avenue. I'm sure you have driven or walked by it, and maybe you've wondered about its history. St. Francis is one of two structures in Laguna Beach on the National Register of Historic Places. The other is Villa Rockledge. Currently, there is talk of nominating the South Coast Theater to the register. The National Register of Historic Places is an official list of national cultural resources that are just significant to the nation, state, or community, and thus judged worthy of preservation. Tonight, I will tell you why St. Francis deserves that honor. But first, a little background. Next. The founder of St. Francis, the Reverend Percy Weiss Clarkson, was an Episcopal cleric who came to Orange County in the 1920s via England and New Zealand. He started the first Episcopal church in Laguna on top of a hill behind where St. Francis is now located. Next. Here you see, at the, uh, you can see St. Francis, the St. Francis Church at the top of this photo of the dedication ceremony of the church in 1926. The ruins of the church, which was also known as St. Francis by the Sea, can be seen there today. At the street entrance, you can see the Lich Gate right here, which resembles entry structures in English country churches. It will come up again later. Now back next, back to Reverend Clarkson. He became interested in world religions and philosoph philosophies, including theosophy. Theosophy is a doctrine of religious philosophy and mysticism and believes that each religion has a portion of the truth. At that time, California was a center for alternative religions and philosophical movements. Reverend Clarkson eventually left the Episcopal Church and as a settlement, he received a small portion of the land where St. Francis is now. St. Francis, I mean, excuse me, Reverend Clarkson eventually joined the American Catholic Church, which was established in the early 20th century in the United States and has its roots in the old Catholic movement. The American Catholic Church does not accept the infallibility of the Pope, priests can marry, and it also ordains women. Reverend Clarkson introduced a theosophical element into the church, which is reflected in the interior of St. Francis. However, theosophical beliefs no longer exist in the American Catholic Church. It is now strictly Christian, and its liturgy and beliefs are similar to the Roman Catholic Church. Next. Architecturally, St. Francis is a mixture of styles, Mediterranean revival, craftsman, Gothic, Romanesque. It was built from the rubble of the 1933 Long Beach earthquake. The exterior of the church is built of used brick and ceramic tile taken from the earthquake's rubble, as you can see in this photo of a colorful apse on the side of the church leading to its entrance. Next. The interior of the, of, of the church, the, the interior is stucco and is also accented by colorful ceramic tile. It is small, just over a thousand square feet and seats just 58 people. For a while, it was on the Guinness Book of Records for the world's smallest cathedral. However, a smaller cathedral in Missouri unseated St. Francis from that honor. Next. The most outstanding features of the interior are the dark wood rafters. 
written upon them in gold and red orange are spiritual signs and sayings from many different religions. Jessica De Stefano, Reverend Clarkson's granddaughter and an artist in town, has recorded, has recorded the rafters in a booklet, the raft called the Rafters of St. Francis, which allows us easier access to read them. And here are some examples of the rafters. You will notice they represent many different religions and philosophies. For example, the first one, if you look down here, here it says Cyrus, who was an Egyptian god of fertility and the dead, Moses, Buddha, Joseph, Elohim, is a Hebrew word for God, and Jesus. And, and right above us, if you can just write here in, Jessica, in Jessica's book, that God is, this God is boundlessness, boundless light, boundless life, which is a Navajo Indian proverb. And next, on this one, on this one, which is above the altar gates, you can see Aquarius right here. And then down here, the Church of the New Age. And you can't see quite well, you can see here, a sanctuary for all people. And this was before this Church of the New Age and Aquarius was before the 1960s. Mystic symbolism is right next to scientific research, right here, mystic symbolism and scientific research. Next. On a rafter from the choir law, you will see more of Reverend Clarkson's beliefs. No other religion, there is no religion higher than the truth. Religion and truth in God, how many aspects and sides, right here. No religion, no religion in itself. Next. Okay, here's another rafter from Seen from the Choir. International Brotherhood, interracial, right here, International Brotherhood, international, um, race, interracial friendship. This church is to teach and practice freedom of thought, the right, the right to work and live, right here. Whoops, right there. Next. Yeah, Reverend Clarkson was ahead of his time in many ways. Furthermore, on the balcony wall of the church, there were three paintings that portray biblical scenes and occult symbols, separated by decorative painted borders. Here is one of the paintings. Maybe one of these days, someone will study these paintings and interpret their meaning for us. The story is that these paintings and the inscriptions on the rafters were executed by an unknown painter who exchanged his skills for a place to sleep in the church. This should give you an idea of the unique architectural and artistic qualities of St. Francis by the Sea. In regards to the National Register of Historic Places criteria, it should be noted that a site connected with religion must derive its primary significance not from religion, but from archeological, architectural, artistic, or historical importance. St. Francis by the Sea has both architectural and historical significance, as well as religious. Historically, it represents a period in the social history in the first part of the 20th century, when interest in Eastern philosophy and occultism led to the development of alternative religious and philosophical movements in the US. In the first part of the 20th century, California was the center of many theosophy-oriented religious and philosophical movements, which included well-known philosophical centers in Point Loma in San Diego and Ojai, the Liberal Catholic Church in Los Angeles, the Rosicrucians in San Jose, and the Manly, and Manly Peace Hall's Philosophical Research Society in Los Angeles. Architecturally, the building is significant as an example of many diverse design elements effectively combined into an integrated whole. These diverse elements symbolize the many influences affecting the church's doctorate at that time. Next. My last slide shows Bishop Simon Talarsic by the Lich Gate, remember which we saw in an earlier slide, at St. Francis by the Sea, the National Register of Historic uh, Places plaque 
plaque is on the pillow of the gate to the bishop's right. The church received this honor in 1988. The lich gate is at the entrance to the bricks pathway that leads to the entrance of St. Francis. It also is a historic memory of the first St. Francis by the Sea Church built by Reverend Clarkson, which you saw earlier. To sum up, the single most outstanding historical importance of St. Francis by the Sea is its preservation of an alternative religious movement. Few buildings of alternative movements remain intact and Laguna Beach is fortunate to have one of such beauty and meaning. The end. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Mrs. Frank, for that explanation of this uh, historic landmark that so many people walk by so often in our city. Now they get to have a little bit more of a unique understanding of it. All right. So we have our Mr. Ed Stork, who is going to talk to us. He is the president of the Laguna Beach Historical Society. He's going to talk to us a little bit more about its history and how you can get involved with it. Thank you. First, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for attending and thank all of my colleagues here who made these fantastic presentations of just a few of the vignettes of our history. Our history is so rich and full and we're all volunteers and that's what we what we do here. Uh, let me read to you what the mission is of the Good of Each Historical Society and then it, it talk about that for a few minutes. The mission of the Laguna Beach Historical Society shall be the collection, preservation, and dissemination of knowledge about the history of Laguna Beach, California, put simply. <laughs> and that's what we're about. And we've been doing that even during the pandemic, but we haven't had our everything open, but we do it by Zoom, by email, by phone, and we're still collecting artifacts, answering questions, and being involved in history. And hopefully, before too long, we'll also be open again. The, the Laguna Beach Historical Society you see in front of you, and it is on 278 Ocean Avenue between Wells Fargo Bank and the uh, Whole Foods grocery store. And it is across the street from the uh, Bank of America. So we got a lot of banks around there. It, it is a house that was built in 1923. And we call it the Murphy Smith Bungalow, even though it's more like our headquarters and it is a museum. And we hope it gets to come there. We hope to open it again soon. Uh, it's the archives. We have huge amounts of archives and we can't keep most of them in this house. So the archives are in a vault next door at the Wells Fargo Bank, which is filled from floor to ceiling with archives. We don't, don't know where to move. We're looking for some more space. If you know anybody that's interested, someplace not only we, we can store archives and pictures, but we can also have a place where people can come in and, and do research. The, the Murphy family were the first ones to move in there after it was built. Now, the uh, interesting part of the Murphy family, I guess everybody seems to think it's, it's very interesting, is that the Mr. Murphy, it turns out, there's, he's in the picture on, the, uh, on our right-hand side with the two children there. Not his children, but that, that's Mr. Murphy. The problem with Mr. Murphy was it was prohibition. And the 278 Ocean Avenue house where his family lived was also a place where illegal liquor was kept, was delivered and <laughs> dispersed. And he got away with it for quite a while and with police protection and other things, but he was in, eventually indicted for it. And we have no record that he was ever convicted, but <laughs> he left, he and his family left. And when they left, Mrs. Smith moved in. Her mother had a boarding house across the street and she bought the house for, for uh, Mrs. Smith. And Mrs. Smith came there in the 1930s. We don't have pictures of her here. We go there. We have a picture of her in 1930 and also in 1990. She was there a long time, not the whole time. but And uh, she lived to be in her 90s. And uh, that house was into the 1990s. So it's it's been there a long time. The Smith family left after the uh, the indictment of Mr. <laughs> Mr. Smith and prohibition. She lived most of that time and was very well known in the neighborhood. Here. Her husband wasn't there, and she would walk up and down the streets. And, of course, the street changed from a residential street to a business street. And uh, everybody seemed to know her. She'd walk down to the beach and do that sort of thing. Uh, she 
she uh, sold the, the house to the Lagoon Beach Federal Savings and Loan, which is no longer there, but its successor is Wells Fargo Bank. And Wells Fargo Bank owns the bungalow, and uh, which we at least from them. And uh, they provide a storage space over there for our archives. We would like, if you have an opportunity, to get involved. The first thing you can do when we reopen, which we hope won't be too long from now, we can close for a year, and we hope that you'll come and visit us. We have been and we tend to be open every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from 1 to 4 p.m. That's the house. And uh, we hope to open it up again. And we hope if you haven't visited, you'll come soon when it's open. And if you have, come and see. Uh, we change a lot of displays. We try to uh, have make the displays change over and over so you come many times. But the house itself, everybody that comes in says, what a, what a wonderful place this is. Such a, a piece of the the 20s and 30s and maybe the 40s in Lagoon Beach and certainly older than, than most of you that are listening to this here today. Uh, there's other ways you can get involved. You can come visit. You can uh, be supportive of our activities or come up with archives and other, it's historical information. Uh, you could be a, a volunteer. We need volunteers, especially when we reopen. We'll need people to, to we had a core of those volunteers, but we'll need people when we open up, and including if you're a high school student, uh, you could, you'd have to have a, an adult with you. It could be one of our people, or it could be a parent or a friend. You could get community service credit for that, for being uh, coming there. And it doesn't take a lot of skill, <laughs> even if you think you don't have a lot of skill. What you need is a lot of enthusiasm and be a good host and provide hospitality to our guests who are from Laguna Beach and are from all over the country and the world. And we get people from everywhere and they almost always say, thank you for keeping this, this peace of Laguna Beach alive and well, and uh, we want to continue that. Uh, the Let's go through yeah, some pictures. To the right is the kitchen, and to the left is the porch, which is on the back of the house and was added to the house. It's a small house. And go ahead with the next one there. Oh, there we're back to the house again, okay. What I want to do is leave this on for a little while so that you may be able to get in touch with us for whatever reason. Whether you want to be a volunteer, you just have questions. We have a website where you can ask questions and they're always answered. Even if we, we can look to find the answers even if we don't know them. And there's the email and there's the website. And you can get in touch with that, us that way. Our next newsletter will be coming out in April. And it has a new format, as a matter of fact. I think you'll like it. If you join between now and then, you'll get one of our newsletters. The uh, membership is only $25 a year. I, you can get more, but $25 will get your family in or, or an individual. And we hope to see you before too long. And uh, I think that's about all I have to say. And thank you for coming. And thank you to Ms. Shelby Anderson for putting this all together. We really appreciate it. Well, and thank you so much, Mr. Stork. Um, I will leave this up for a little bit longer. We also have a little bit of time for question and answer. If um, anybody has any questions, um, I've gotten a few that I will read out loud if I would like. Um, we've got, what years did Reverend Carson minister at the church? I believe that would be a question for Ms. Ann Frank. Okay, he was there. Uh, basically in the 19, late 1920s, 1930s. Late and 19th. Church, we, you know, he died, I believe, in 42. But the church, you know, kept the theosophical element, I think, until the early, uh, the very early 60s. But now it's strictly Christian. All right. Uh, we also have, what year was the townhouse built? What year was what? The townhouse built, I believe, are we referring to uh, the bungalow, I believe. Bungalow, 1923. That was before Laguna Beach was incorporated as a city. All right, there we go. All right, if we have more questions, our uh, board members are happy to assist and answer. And yes, this recording will be posted on uh, the Laguna Beach Historical Society website. So this will be available to people who were not able to attend. We also have Miss Sweet saying her grandfather was Glenn Vetter, also involved in the festival board. Uh, 
what is a homestead? Is it just a bit of land? I believe that's for uh, Miss Miss Lloyd. You have to unmute. Uh, Lloyd. <laughs> no, a homestead was truthfully a legal uh, uh, process that someone would have to go through to get the amount of acreage that was given through the Homestead Act that Abraham Lincoln put through. It was not uh, squatters where they would just come and plop themselves on a piece of land. It truthfully was given through the Congress uh, enactment in, uh, and it really brought, it was, the purpose of it was to bring people out to the West and the Great Plains in the central US. Uh, it was not, you had to prove up in five years, you either had to uh, put uh, some crops on it or a small home of which my great great grandfather did in Temple Hills. And you ha otherwise you would have to buy it, buy it for I think it was, uh, uh, I'm not sure $5 an acre. Uh, so you did have to prove up to really show value that you had a reason for being there. So no, it was a real legal um, process and it was upheld by the Congress and signed by the current president of the United States. Right. Uh, Dr. Matthews, I believe you have a hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to, I, everything Carol said is absolutely accurate, but I just wanted to point out that um, the fact that it passed in 1862 during the Civil War was not a coincidence. As long as the Southern states were in the Union, they did not want uh, Western expansion unless they knew that those uh, Western states would be slave states. And so they were the, the break on getting free land uh, enacted. So anyhow, it passes in 1862. A lot of important legislation passed during the Civil War because the Southern states were no longer there to block it. Right. Um, we have a question for Ed, which you will have to unmute, but to Ed, what got you interested in Laguna history? Well, it's, it's an interesting thing to say because all these other people and everybody, almost everybody else on the board has been in Laguna for many, many, many years. And I've not been here that long. I have a Johnny come lately. I was from the Chicago area, but I've been in the history for all my life. And I, uh, it kind of fell into it. I, I saw the house one day, went in there with one of my history professors and uh, got interested, went to some meetings and they decided I should be involved. And it's been, it's been a lot of fun working with these people, but also I'm learning much more about the history, not only by being a bungalow, it's an advantage if you go there and, and spend some time. If they're not people there, you can always look around and see all the history. But I'm trying to immerse myself in Laguna Beach history. I don't have the family history that these have. But that doesn't make it here. <laughs> Still very passionate. Yes. All righty. So we have another question. Uh, just curious, is there anything in the archives about Tommy Ayer Chevrolet? My grandmother's best friend was Marie. I'm probably saying this wrong, but Ayers, and lived on Tempa Hills Drive. Anything in the archives about Tommy Ayer Chevrolet? I don't know that we would know what's in the archives. Our archivist is not here. Uh, the best thing to do would be to send that to our website. And uh, Johanna Ellis, our webmaster, will research that and get back to you with an answer. So that's our best shot for an answer for that. Yeah. All righty. Um, did Carol say that George Rogers Crane of Forest Avenue and some of the main streets in town? Uh, yes, he named Forest Avenue because from his ranch house where the city hall now exists, he could see that he and his father, Henry, planted all the eucalyptus trees then on Forest Avenue. So they named it Forest Avenue because of all those eucalyptus trees. And then he named Ocean Avenue because he could see the ocean from his ranch house. And when he subdivided, he, he really did uh, scroll out all of those streets, but whether he was the one that named all of them or not, I'm not sure. Yep, so I think that's an answer to that. Um, somebody else says, I love the homestead map of Laguna Beach. I need to learn how to do that for my town. So, oh my. <laughs> well, 
I wish you, I, I wish you would, I mean, it's amazing the amount of work and I know oh I know this names on the attendees and some of the names that I know of on, on our panel that my mother did tremendous amount of work to put that together. She did her primary research in doing all those searches of the titles, which means that it, they had never truthfully been put into books before. So she went ahead with my dad and did that. And I think if you start off checking out your town's history, wherever you are, get into those depth, uh, depth areas and libraries, et cetera, of archives, it will give you a passion, which my mother tremendously had. Uh, to go ahead and start that. Carol, it was so impressive. I've heard other presentations, but tonight when you went, you know, through each detail of what your mom did, it just blew me away. I mean, how meticulous her research was. It's so impressive yeah. and such a gift to the town. Yeah, that's what she wanted it to be. She said that that's why she put that map together and did all the research for Laguna Beach because she loved Laguna, she loved the people in it and around it, and she wanted those that appreciated Laguna history as she has done to, to be able to access all that information. And I left a lot on the cutting floor, which we all know we all did in our presentation, so there's so much more that we could have shared about. Yes, um, someone else um, is asking where we can find all the pictures used in the slideshow. Um, I believe that's uh, Mr. Simpson, you were one of my students. You're welcome to email me. Um, but I can also um, put this up on uh, the Laguna Beach Historical Society. I can share that with them and their website um, as well on that. So if you need to, Mr. Swinson, I know that you can email me. Um, we also have, were there any Native American tribes that were in Laguna when the first people came here? Well, my mother wrote about that a lot, but I know, I don't know specifically. Um, I know that the Native Americans that were in the San Juan Capistrano Mission area when Spain basically owned Baja California, as they called it, uh, and Father, Jun Father Junipero Sierra came up with his mission trail. They bypassed Laguna Beach because the foothills possibly, but probably also because of the flatlands that they saw as they made the turn inward from San Juan Capistrano. And they were looking for flat farm acreage to put the next mission areas on. I think the Indians that they encountered there were, were the ones that might have been more prevalent than, than any other tribes. And those were, I believe, the Juana, what were they? The, Somebody might know. We know those names. Juaninos. I mean, they were called Juaninos. But the early, the Indian names, um, I mean, it's a very long word. And I, I, if I tried to reproduce uh -huh. it, I would be uh, making a mistake. I don't know that at the time, for example, that your ancestors came, there would have been any Indians here. I think it's, you know, either they were driven out by the Spanish or they, you know, they, they went either to the mission or further inland to get away, but I don't think they would have been here. Right. All righty. Uh, when this talk is posted, where we'll be able to find it, um, we'll post on the Laguna Beach Historical Society page um, in order for people to have access to that. Um, is your institution in the process of digitizing your collection? Um, I don't know. Um, Mr. Stork, if you know, I believe you're muted again. Um, if anybody's digitized. Uh, uh, yes, it's supposed to be digitized, but uh, we don't want it just to be digitized. So people say you don't need all that storage. Well, it's not real history that we want to preserve the real history and not just a digitized version of it. We do digitize all the documents or all as many as we can, but we do want to keep the most important of the original documents. So our ancestors can see these things uh, from you know Laguna Beach's history, and as you can probably see, that this is just a few of our board members, but we're all pretty enthusiastic, uh, and we love Laguna Beach. <laughs> all right, and for me, um, somebody else to Shelby Anderson, have your classes already looked into Laguna history uh, with the current uh, method of which we're doing school right now, which is a trimester system where we have twelve weeks to get through the curriculum. It is not made the cut, <laughs> hence the, the, the goal of hosting this event was to expose my students and other students of Laguna Beach to um, our history 
Um, it just was a uh, extra event versus ingrained in the curriculum as we only have 12 weeks to get through the entirety of US history. So this is more of an extra fun thing if they chose to come and I encouraged them as much as I could. So hopefully some of my students came. Um, somebody else says thank you. Could add one thing on that. Normally at this time of year, we uh, either go to the elementary schools or they come by field trips down to the uh, Murphy Smith bungalow. And they, cause third grade is the time when they talk about local sites. Some people listening to that may have gone there when they were in third grade. And, but we can't do it this year for obvious reasons. So we have had, we couldn't do it last year either. So we missed a couple of years. Well, we tried to make inroads. We're glad to be with high school here. And anytime that you want to involve us, we'd like to be involved in, uh, in helping with preserve the history of Laguna Beach. Thanks. Definitely. Um, somebody else says thank you all for the fantastic presentation. So thank you very much for your uh, graciousness. We appreciate that. Um, somebody else says, I'm a board member at the Historical Society. I just want to say that this is a wonderful presentation with a great cross section of Laguna Beach history. I learned about many things I didn't know. Thank you to Ms. Anderson for putting this together. Thanks to all the board members for putting together uh, informative information. Write to us at info at lagunabeachhistory.org for any questions. So that would be Ms. Joanna Ellis. Um, she is the one who is on the receiving end of those emails and she is very responsive if anybody has any questions. So that would be her. We also have someone else saying, I didn't catch why Wells Fargo has asked the organization to move out. What are their plans for the historic cottage? I don't know who can answer that. Okay. Uh, I don't know much. They didn't ask us to move out. I don't know where I, I said that wrong or something. Would, would they give us the storage space in Wells Fargo Bank in a vault there? Someday they may need that and they may ask us to use that, but they've never done that. They, we get that for free. We, we pay a dollar a year for the rental on the bungalow. So that they, they are giving us that access. I don't see any time they throw us out. What we do need space for those to use these archives and, and uh, you would know that Ms. Anderson and other historians, you can't in a room with the way it is, only our archivists can find anything. And it's so small, you can't, you can't really do any work. And uh, we really need a spot where we could organize them in such a way that scholars and just regular citizens of Laguna Beach and others that are interested come in and look at the documents that interest them. But between now and then you'll have to contact uh, Johanna Ellison. She'll look up something and, and give you an answer. Yes, so it looks like we're, we still have good relationships with Wells Fargo, good stuff. Yes. Um, we also have, I'm interested in photography of my immediate neighborhood when it was first developed um, on Cliff Drive in 1939. I've looked at First American, where else? So looking for original photography, would that be contacting uh, Joanna, Mr. Stark? Do you think that's the yes. best presentation? Contact her on that. And also uh, the public library might have some materials. Uh, we have a board member, Nelda, who is uh, at the library and she's, there are research materials um, about Laguna at the library. So I, I can't say that it would be there, but it might be. Right, so there you go, Mr. Bryan. Hopefully that helps your search. Um, someone else says, amazing job to all the participants. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I'm probably gonna butcher this, but we have the nation, the Native American tribe. Um, I'm going to spell it because I'm not going to be able to pronounce that. A C J A H C E M E N. Aksha. I'm not even going to try. I I will not do it justice. So um, that Native American tribe was the one that was in our area, um, and we can visit. Cuneo.com for more information about um, that Native American tribe who was in this area. So hopefully that answers some of these questions. Uh, J-U-A-N-E-N-O.com where we can get more information on that. We have in the past have, uh, <clears throat> we've had presentations on the Native American past. And so uh, <clears throat> once again, Joanna might be able to point someone because uh, we record all of our presentations. And so there might be a presentation in, you know, a, a video of that presentation uh, that Joanna would be able to point someone to. I, I forgot to mention that the, 
we do normally, we normally have a, a program about every other month, not in the summer, but the rest of the year on various topics about Laguna Beach. But it's been a long time now because of the pandemic that we can do it in person. We're going to try to do it by Zoom, but it's it's not ideal for the kind of things we do. But we will we will go back to having our regular newsletter and our regular meetings and so forth once this thing gets over. <laughs> Somebody says a Koshman is how my friend, a tribe member, pronounces it, a Koshman. So that is my attempt. So thank you for um, that person trying to help me out pronounce that. All right. Um, we've also got another thank you for our presentation. Uh, also another thank you for the excellent and informative presentations. Somebody loved hearing about Laguna Teens firsthand from Glenna Matthews. So somebody enjoyed the firsthand account. Um, we also got another thank you for the presentation. Um, we've also glad, uh, someone said, I'm so glad I misunderstood and the society will remain at the cottage. Phew. <laughs> um, we've also got Joanna answered, uh, for historical photos, go to the Historical Society website um, to find our, our link on smugmug.com. So that's where all of the um, pictures are contained. Um, somebody else says OC story, Stories Projects with OC Libraries is an incredible collection. They have photos and oral histories. So if people were looking for more of those photos, it looks like the OC Libraries as a whole um, does a very good job at collecting those. Um, someone else says we found a lot of Indian arrowheads in caves at the top of the world in the 1960s. So I uh, that, that sounds fascinating. Um, and Joanna says, we also have digitized all possible presentations that we have done. The videos are available on our YouTube channel. Um, and then we just got um, somebody asking how many viewers we had today. And I think we were up to 60. We were up to 60 at our highest point. So I think that is wonderful for a pandemic presentation. <laughs> all right. So I think that would be everybody that sent in questions. We have one more. Um, we did a video tour for the third graders in Tustin. They are on YouTube. Are you planning to do the same? So um, they were asking if you want to do a video tour of the bungalow and things like that for the third graders. Do you guys plan on doing that? We don't have any specific plans, but we we'll certainly consider that. Sounds, it sounds like a good suggestion that maybe that can happen. Yeah. All right. I think that is all of the questions that I have collected. Thank you everybody for attending our talk. Thank you to the students who popped in. Thank you to the community members who came to our talk. Um, hopefully you enjoyed it as much as we did getting to pull this together for our community and provide some kind of uh, educational and entertainment value when uh, our city, which is normally so bustling full of this type of um, entertainment is so limited during the pandemic. So hopefully you guys enjoyed it and thank you for taking the time out of your evening. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Shelby. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Shelby, for getting us all together to put this on. No problem. I thoroughly enjoyed getting to do it for everybody. <laughs>